Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. During the Bosnian War in the early 1990s, an estimated 100,000 people died and millions were displaced. The conflict produced the worst atrocities in Europe since World War II. But Nikolina Kulijan was 12 years old before war broke out and had no idea any of that was on the horizon. Her essay is called A Kiss Deferred by Civil War, and it's read by Joanna Kulig, who stars in the new movie Cold War. Many saw it coming. Ethnically charged graffiti began appearing on the buildings around town. The local newspapers published the locations of bomb shelters. A classmate told me not to sleep in my bedroom because it faced military barracks. I dismissed these warnings just as I ignored all other signs of coming doom. In my 12-year-old mind, our town of Mostar in Bosnia and Herzegovina was too beautiful and the people too good for there to be a civil war. Besides, that spring was promising to be the greatest time of my life. I was happily in love for the first time. I saw Marco at school and was attracted to his eyes and playful smile. One afternoon, while walking home from a piano lesson, I saw him coming down the hill on his skateboard. He stopped just short of running into me. I don't remember us saying much. We just stood there and smiled. But that's all it took to seal the deal and we became inseparable. Marco was in a fifth grade, and I was in sixth. He was short, and I was tall. He was Croatian, and I was Serbian. Soon, our ethnic groups would find themselves in the middle of a bloody civil war. But for the moment, None of that mattered. What mattered was how good it felt to be seen by him, to be let in on his secrets and jokes, to share friends and enemies, to take on the same adventures. One day a group of us has decided to climb an abandoned building and jump off its flat roof. I was standing on the edge, 12 feet above the dirt, my heart racing when Marco scooted next to me. You are the bravest girl I know, he whispered. With those words, my fear disappeared and I took the leap. The day the war started, Marco and I walked home together. We had been released from school a few hours early without explanation. As he walked, he told me that if war broke out, his family would go to split Croatia. He asked what my family would do. I had no idea. The possibility had never been discussed in my home. Right then my plans extended only to 6 p.m. when I was supposed to meet him and the rest of our friends. With that agreement, we parted. Less than a half hour later, as I was walking upstairs to our apartment, an explosion shook the building. The blast threw me down the stairs and the building went dark. 
Later, I would learn that a truck packed with explosives had been detonated in the street between our building and the army barracks. All I knew then was that I had to find my family. I got up and stumbled outside. People were rushing every which way. Some were crying, some bleeding. I ran to my aunt's place where my mother was. She took me into her arms and held me for a long time. Everything will be fine, she kept saying. I wasn't convinced. My plans for the evening were obviously ruined, and I knew it would be a while before I would be free to plan anything else. I had to get in touch with Marco. I had to tell him I was okay, that we were okay. I dialed a number, terrified by having to speak or by having to explain whom I was calling. Marco's father answered, light-headed with worry I asked for Marco. I don't know what I hope to hear from him. Maybe that whatever was happening outside had no bearing on us. No ethnic squabble or civil war could ruin what we have. At the very least, I thought he would ask if I was okay. He didn't. He barely said a word. We exchanged a few syllables and then I hung up. The next day we learned that my childhood home was gone, destroyed in the blast. Two weeks later, my brother, cousins and I were sent to another town. From our exile, I wrote Marco Long, never to be sent letters, describing the anger, sadness and displacement I felt. A few weeks later, it became clear to my parents that what was happening in and around Mostar was not a minor squabble, but a war. They decided to take what was most important, my brother and me, and live for good. We settled in Belgrade, Serbia. We were living in a tiny attic apartment with walls so thin we could hear every word of our neighbors' conversations. Whenever I opened my mouth to speak, I saw people labeling me as a refugee. Even so, one evening, only months after we had left Mostar, a boy from my new school asked to walk me home. We didn't say much as we walked, but in front of my building he bent over and pressed his mouth on mine. His tongue felt like fish, slimy and twitching. His name was also Marco, and that was my first kiss. As soon as he left, I wiped my mouth, feeling cheated. I had been robbed of love. And this is what I got in return? For years, I continued to think about my original Marco. The memory had become synonymous with lost innocence and never again possible perfection. Those brief days of happiness shone brightly through the tragedy that followed. When I started dating, I jokingly told boys that I had this unfinished relationship and couldn't fully commit. Yet the few times I traveled back to my hometown after the war, I didn't dare look Marco up. I thought about it and even knew how to get in touch through a friend of his sister. But I always decided against it. What if he didn't even remember me? What if those years had erased all we shared? What if my being a Serb and his being a Croat was a bigger deal now than when we were children? Most of all, I feared that nothing would remain of the bright-eyed boy who followed me home from school on a skateboard, chased me down the stairs and 
poured baking soda into a bottle of Coke to impress me. So I put my Marco memories away. Then one morning, 16 years after fleeing my hometown, I opened my email at home in San Jose, California, to find Marco's name in the inbox. His message read, If you are Nikolina from Mostar, then I have been your boyfriend since fifth grade. Please get back to me, so we can figure out what to do. Those two lines were all it took to make my fears disappear. Marco was still the playful boy I had loved. We spent the next few weeks emailing. Some of my memories had faded, others were so real I worried I had invented them, but he remembered some of the same things and just differently enough to make my own memories even more real. He told me some things I didn't know, like how much he had always wanted to kiss me. He also told me that for years he had beaten himself up for not saying more when I called. It was a couple of years before I could get back to Mostar. When I did, Marco and I met at the usual spot at the bottom of the hill where he first approached me on his skateboard. We were strangers. We would not have noticed each other on the street. Yet we understood something about each other that no one else did or could. Like the first time, we stood for a long while, just smiling. Unlike my other Croatian friends, who refused to go to the Muslim side of town, Marco seemed happy to be there. He led the way from our schoolyard to the old town where the 400-year-old Ottoman bridge had been blown to pieces during the war. From the rooftop, we had the perfect view of the illuminated bridge in all its reassembled glory. Over white wine, Marco and I talked for hours, recounting our youth, our shared sense of dislocation and the many acts of infidelity we had committed against each other over our nearly two decades apart. Like the bridge, our lives had been shattered and then put back together. We were still gathering pieces, only now we had one fewer piece to look for. With a few sips of wine left in our glasses, Marco and I touched hands leaned in and kissed. For that moment, it was as if nothing had been lost. That's Joanna Kulig, reading Nikolina Kuligin's essay, A Kiss Deferred by Civil War. So what happened next for Nikolina and Marco? More after the break. Nikolina Kuligin says that when her family left Mostar, they did so abruptly, with just two suitcases. After arriving in Belgrade, she started writing to Marco. Leaving my hometown, I mean, that was by far the biggest trauma 
possibly of my life to date, not just of my life, you know, up to the age of 12. It was extremely disruptive. It was tragic. It was extremely upsetting. Um, I was convinced that I would never again feel like I belonged anywhere. And in some way, I was actually right. I mean, I never quite belonged anywhere in the same way that I had before then. I needed an outlet for those feelings that I had, and writing to Marco was an outlet for that. And she told us more about what it felt like to get his note so many years later. The message arrived in my email inbox saying, you have a message from Marco Lasic through Facebook. And just to see Marco Lasic in my inbox was just so exciting. And it was a little bit like, you know, having your dream come true. And then when I read the message itself, I just thought it was funny. It was brilliant. On the surface, it sounds so serious. And, you know, I've I've been your boyfriend since fifth grade. Get back to me so we can figure out what to do about it. But no, I mean, (laughs) it didn't for a second occur to me that he was seriously asking me to get back to him so he can figure out, (laughs) you know, how to resume this relationship that had been interrupted. You know, in a way, it's almost like a typical Bosnian humor. And that's what I really loved about it, that he knew that I would know that it was humor. So there was multiple layers of trust involved in this message. But some readers interpreted that note and Nicolina and Marco's relationship differently. So it really took me by surprise when this piece came out, is how many people wrote to ask what happened after. And it just never occurred to me that this story could have any happier ending than the ending that we had. Um, We were sitting at this beautiful terrace overlooking this beautiful bridge that had been destroyed in the war and then put together. And, I mean, to me, that was like sort of like my heart, like my life. It had been destroyed and then it was put together. And now when we met and we were talking and we kissed, what I had lost in my life, you know, some of it at least had been found and put back in place. And, you know, I don't think we were trying to rekindle a romance. I think we were trying to honor our past together and really clinging to something beautiful from it. So for all the curious readers who really want to know. Um, We are married. We're just not married to each other. Marco had the baby boy last year. I see pictures on Facebook. He's cute. Uh, But yeah, no, we did not stay together. Nicolina says that by the time they reunited in Mostar, she and Marco were living very different lives, his in Croatia and hers in the United States. She says she never thought about changing the course of her life to be with him, To her, their story was about something different. We come from a country where there's a war. Like, every generation remembers a war. My dad, who tomorrow turns 79, remembers three wars. So people, what people remember is crimes and atrocities and slights and insults. And and then what they leave their children in as an inheritance is this desire for revenge and all of that. And for the two of us to actually remember our friendship, our loyalty to each other, to me, that was more than an act of romance. I mean, that really wasn't about romance. It was almost like, you know, a small political act, like an act of courage that says, no, I will not put you in a box with the rest of your tribe that has committed these crimes. No, you're this individual that I have shared something with. I do see that as sort of like, like a small act of redemption. That's writer Nicolina Kuligen. She lives with her husband near Washington, D.C. We've got more after the break. Here's Daniel Jones, editor of the Modern Love column for The New York Times. Well, sometimes an essay is made by a single line. 
And in Nicolina's piece, I was reading along and I thought, well, this is interesting and this is an interesting setting and all of that. And then I got to the line, if you are Nicolina from Mostar, then I have been your boyfriend since fifth grade. Please get back to me so we can figure out what to do. And at that point, I was like, okay, we have to make this essay work. <laughs> Whatever it's going to take, I'm going to get that line into the modern love column. Not saying that it took a lot, but I was, I was committed to this one as soon as I read that line. There's so much trauma from wartime in the world, and this is such a sweet story, and that sweetness is so amplified by the horror of war and resettlement and immediate separation and children trying to make sense of that kind of world. And then the other, the other aspect of this piece is how it, there's sort of an expectation of a Hollywood ending. Oh, well, they're going to get back together and um, romantically after all this time. But it's not a piece that needs that or should go there. It's a piece about moments and how important a moment is and how important a reconnection is, not about the Hollywood, you know, happily ever after. Next week, Connie Nielsen. When I took up tennis, my husband was happy to play with our two children and me, as long as we didn't have to play by the rules. As Dennis repeatedly explained to us, playing by the rules placed him at an unfair disadvantage because he didn't know the rules and he didn't know how to serve. Modern Love is a production of the New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, Caitlin O'Keefe, and John Parati. Original scoring and sound design by Matt Reed. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. I'm Magna Chakrabarty. See you next week.